Turn with me to Revelation 14, the first few verses we looked at, verses 1 through 6. We saw the 144,000, and that was the happy part of this chapter, where you see 144,000 Jews there on Mount Zion, Jesus in their midst, and it wasn't 143,900 or 143,999, 144,000, they all make it through, they're all victorious, God's promises were sure, and so that was the, the happy side of this chapter, and so we left off, we looked at verses 6 and 7, but let's just go back to these real quick, it says in he, uh, Revelation 14, 6, John writes, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe, tongue, um, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Once again, we see that there's three angels in this chapter, and it starts off with the good news the everlasting gospel. He will preach to everyone on planet Earth. And I mentioned last time that this is the fulfillment, I believe, of Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end shall come. So this angel fulfills that promise that the gospel will be preached to everyone. Yes, we're to get the gospel out to as many people as possible in these last days, but ultimately that's going to be fulfilled by this angel. Well, that was good news. Turn to the Lord. Worship Him. Worship the Creator. Don't worship the creation. Worship the Creator. So now look at verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This chapter, it's kind of an outline for the rest of the book of Revelation, because when it talks about Babylon has fallen and has fallen, Babylon is mentioned in three different ways in the, uh, in the Bible. Uh, the first way is that it's a literal city that was in Iraq on the Euphrates River, uh, the second mention of Babylon, it refers to the spiritual Babylon because it was the birthplace of all the pagan religions that are in the world today. This is where they built the Tower of Babel, man trying to reach God without God reaching down to them, but they were trying to make a name for themselves instead of lifting up the one true name of God. And so Babylon is destroyed in chapter 17, but that refers to the spiritual Babylon and all the pagan ideals that they you know, believed in. And it talks about uh, the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Sexual immorality was part of their pagan religious system. Chapter 18 deals with the fall of political or commercial Babylon. Those are the ones that rule over the men's of the earth. People behind the scenes, the, the wealthiest of the wealthy who are pulling strings behind the scenes of all the political leaders, and they're you know, corrupt in every way, and they're wanting to have control and power over people's lives. Well, chapter 18 will deal with the destruction of political, commercial Babylon. You know, when Paul wrote the uh, book of Romans, he gives us this devolution of man, and this has been going on since the fall. And, and people turning to nature, turning to the new green deal instead of worshiping the creator. And Paul knew this. You know, it's been taught for centuries. And this is what Paul says. Look at these verses in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So they suppress the true nature of God, who God really is. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. You know, you hear about, you know, everybody in the world has this void in their life. It can only be filled by God. I mean, God has manifested himself to everyone. You can see it in creation. If there's a creation, there must be a creator. It didn't just happen on its own. There's a creator. And so God's made himself known 
but people will suppress the truth. It says, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. You see how powerful God is holding all the planets in their orbit, the whole solar system, everything, the whole universe. God keeps it on track. And then we'll see at the end of the days, after the millennial reign of Christ, he's going to allow everything to be vaporized. But that's later on. So, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So if you don't want to believe in the one true God of the Bible, then you'll start listening to the lies of the enemy. He will always bring people into darkness. Professing to be wise, uh, we have a lot of these guys in our universities, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. This is what's behind the whole Green New Deal thing is we don't want God. We, and even Al Gore says, we're going to save Mother Earth. Really? Not after we get through Revelation, it is not going to be saved. Jesus will come back. He will restore and it's going to be glorious, but yeah, these guys are just fooling themselves. So they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And the definite article, the lie is the one that, Satan brought to Eve in the garden. Oh, you won't die. You'll just be, you'll become just like God. That's the lie. You don't need God. You can make yourself into a God. There is no God. That's the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This entire pleasure seeking, sin indulging culture that we are living in today, it's going to be destroyed. And we see this very clearly in the rest of the book of Revelation in this chapter as well. So look at verse 9. This is the next angel, the third angel, and it gets worse. First you get the good news, but if you don't want the good news, hey, it's going to get more difficult. It's going to come down to repent and turn to Jesus or else. Verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, that's the Antichrist, and his image, and they're going to set that up in the rebuilt temple. And receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. Chapter 13, verse 18. That's the mark of the beast, 666. If you receive that, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So these are some of the most harsh verses in the Bible. These are harsh and severe warnings. If anyone, it says, worships the Antichrist, you bow down to his image, you take the mark of the beast, God will pour out his wrath in full measure, it says, against those. They will drink from the undiluted cup of his indignation. And to top it off, it says here, they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of God's holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Their torment is will last forever and ever. There's, you know, many false teachings out there. One of them says, oh, when a person dies without God, they just are, you know, annihilated. They cease to exist. They have no consciousness. That'd be good. If you died without God, and then that's it. No torture, no pain, no suffering. The Bible doesn't teach that. You don't find no, you know, you don't find an annihilation anywhere in the scriptures. Here it says they'll be tormented forever and ever. The Greek words are Ais, Ionon, Ionis. And so that means forever and ever. So how long will this last? Well, look at verse uh, 7 of chapter 15. Just skip ahead. Look at verse 7, chapter 15. 
It says, And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Aes, Ianus, Ianon. Same exact words. Forever and ever. So how long is God's wrath? It lasts as long as God lives. That's your proof right there. Why do you suppose that it speaks of Jesus as a lamb here in connection with this harsh judgment? Well, if you remember what the Apostle John first saw when he was taken up into heaven, he saw Jesus as a lamb that had been slain back in chapter 4 and 5. Jesus is still bearing the marks of the crucifixion. I believe he'll bear those marks forever. It's a memorial. It's a sign of his great love for us. It's a perpetual testimony of his grace and his sacrifice for our sins. And instead of these people wanting to be identified with Jesus, who died for their sins, they will reject God's love and compassion and mercy and grace. They reject the gospel and they will take the mark of the Antichrist upon themselves and how tragic it'll be in that day when they stand in the presence of the Lamb and face the eternal consequences of choosing the Antichrist over Jesus Christ. Now, anytime I come to verses like this when they're talking about drinking from the cup of God's wrath, I'm always reminded that God offers people one of two cups. There's two cups that God hand, holds in his hand. He has the cup of wrath, but he also has the cup of fellowship, the cup of communion. Remember what he offered his disciples the, the night before he was betrayed and crucified. He loves you, and he doesn't want you to be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. But the, the point is, Jesus drank the full measure of wrath that you and I deserve. So when you come to Christ, the wrath has already been taken care of. That's why we won't go through this time frame known as the wrath of God, the great tribulation. Jesus absorbed in himself the wrath, the penalty, the judgment that I deserve for my sins. But if you reject Jesus and you're in this time frame of the great tribulation, you will face his wrath because you rejected the, the other cup he offers you. So this is what we read in Matthew 26, starting in verse 39, when Jesus is praying about the cup he's about to drink from. It says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then a few moments later, it's in Matthew 26, verse 42. It says, again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. It says he prayed that prayer three times. But again, Jesus knew there was no other way for us to be saved, for sinners to be forgiven, unless he drank that cup of God's wrath when he hung on the cross for our sins. Somehow, some way, I don't fully comprehend it, God the Father poured out his full measure of wrath upon his only begotten Son. And this is why we read in Matthew's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel, Jesus hanging on the cross, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, he's absorbing the penalty and the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. So now he offers us the cup of fellowship if you come to him by faith. You know, Jesus at that moment was fulfilling so many scriptures like Isaiah 53, 6, where it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned each one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He did it for us. And so for all of us who have turned to Christ for salvation, he now offers us the, the cup of fellowship. This is what he says in Matthew 26, verse 28, when they're partaking of communion, he's instituting communion. First he says, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. That God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Much more than having now been justified by his blood. When did that happen? The very moment you were saved. The very moment Christ came into your life, he justified you. Just as if you'd never sinned. That's how the Father sees you now, because you are in Christ. So much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. And that's what we're reading about in the book of Revelation here. We'll be saved from wrath through him. So what an extreme contrast we have here. When he, when he came into our lives and he saved us, he took away the cup of wrath that we were to drink from, and he replaced it with this cup of fellowship. But for those who reject his cup of fellowship, they will drink from the cup of wrath is, that is mentioned here. Look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Again, those who reject Christ and receive the mark, they will have eternal torment. But here we see that many people during the Great Tribulation will reject the Antichrist. They will turn to Jesus Christ. They will believe the everlasting gospel. And here they are called blessed. Yes, they will be killed, as it mentions here. It's a strange phrase. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. In other words, it will certainly be a brutal time during the Great Tribulation, but the good news is it's only temporary. For all those who follow Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is saying here, yes, now they have rest. And they will be rewarded because of what they have done you know, until they're put to death. They're living for Jesus during this horrible time. The rest they have, it's going to be a, a sharp contrast to the wicked. Look back at verse 11 in this chapter again. Look at verse 11 where it says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have what? No rest. No rest, day or night, who worship the beast. Here we say, Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. You know, a lot of times we may think, Lord, it is really hard living as a Christian in this fallen world, this sinful world. I sure hope it's worth it. Uh, believe me, it's worth it. When you see Jesus face to face, you're going to realize whatever trial, whatever struggle, whatever disease, whatever it might be that you fought and maybe were defeated in, whatever takes your life, you're going to realize all these hassles were worth it. We were just at a funeral yesterday. Many of you know Rich Coates, Rich and Deborah. And um, Rich went home to be with the Lord a few weeks ago, first part of this month. And Rich fought the good fight. You know, he stayed on course. He finished the race. Um, it was about 12 years ago, 2010, we were getting ready to go to Israel. And they were all signed up to go. And he was so excited. Two weeks before we're going to Israel, the doctor says, you got cancer in your throat. And it was very aggressive. So he was so bummed. He goes, well, can I wait till after Israel? And he goes, no, no, we got to get on this right away. So they started doing the radiation, the chemo. I went to a couple of the sessions with him, and it was brutal. I mean, literally looked like by the time he was done, like somebody took a flamethrower to his neck. It was just raw, red. He was pretty much homebound for about a year. He just felt so bad. And then he came out of it. He started feeling better. And the Lord, you know, worked in his life. God used him in tremendous ways. And then it came back a few months back, really heavy and strong, and took him home. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. He is at home. He is at rest. As bad as the things he went through over the last 12 years or so, do you think he's thinking, wow, that was really bad? Right now, no. He's seeing Jesus face to face, and he is just so excited to be in the presence of the Lord. Of course it's worth it. Whatever you face here and now, it's worth it. Don't have any doubts. When you see the Lord, all these struggles, all these hardships, it's going to seem like just a vapor because our lives are a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17. And here's a guy that, you know, went through shipwrecks and stonings and beatings, 
chased from one place to another. He is stoned and left for dead. He's imprisoned. And he says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. And it is. The older you get, the more you realize that. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. This always blows me away when Paul says, for our light affliction. Light affliction? Again, read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 11 and 12, and he goes through this whole list of all these horrible things he had to go through. But it says, the love of Christ constrained me, he, he writes. The love of Christ is what kept me going, even though I was beaten and, and you know, struck down and you know, rocks thrown at me. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, again, in this 70, 80, 90 years we might have here on planet Earth, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In other words, the, the glory of the Lord outweighs anything that this world throws at you. Any trial, struggle, hardship you face, the weight of God's glory will infinitely be more weighty and awesome. But in the meantime, because we don't mourn as those who have no hope, we have rest in Jesus. Jesus says to you, maybe you're in unrest right now. Jesus says, come to me. Remember Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It, it, you find that rest in Jesus, not in the things of this world. Well, look at verse 14. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. Now, in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Again, this is a preview of the final battle of Armageddon. We'll see this in greater detail in chapter 16, but this is a picture of Jesus, the Son of Man, just before he descends from heaven to earth at his second coming. The harvest of judgment upon those who reject Christ and have worshipped the Antichrist is a picture that we clearly See, in Revelation 19, when he returns, Jesus will defeat all of the armies of the earth. He will defeat all the armies of the Antichrist. And even though there are many Old Testament prophecies that speak of Jesus as the Messiah who will crush his enemies, a lot of people have a hard time seeing Jesus in this role. You know, they like to look at Jesus as the meek and mild little child, the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But it's a two-sided coin when it comes to Jesus. On one side, yes, the Lamb, and we love all these verses about His love, His compassion, His mercy, His grace, that He will heal those who are hurting and struggling. You know, we, we see Jesus for three and a half years of His earthly ministry in the gospel fulfilling so many prophecies about the Lamb and His wonderful, amazing ministry. Remember when Jesus is in um, his hometown of Lazarus, or hometown of Nazareth, and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up to our Isaiah 61. They didn't have verses and chapters back then, but he finds a place where it's written of him, and it's found in Luke, cha or, yeah, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus quotes himself from a prophecy 700 years earlier, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did throughout Israel. Yes, he was very compassionate. He was meek. He was crucified on the cross for our sins. We, we see him throughout the Gospels, opening blind eyes and deaf ears, and opening those who were dumb, they could speak, 
Those who had leprosy, he cured. Those who had demons, they were possessed. He cast the demons out. He even raised some people from the dead. That's a beautiful part of his ministry. That's the side of the coin that we always look at, and we love to see these things. We see a little glimmer of when he becomes like the lion of the tribe of Judah, when he flips over the money changers' tables. Just for a very short season, he rebukes them for turning God's house of worship into a den of thieves. But for the most part, he revealed the Father's heart of love and compassion and mercy. That's how he is right now. But a time is coming when that other side of the coin will be revealed, and he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And that is going to be brutal. He came as the lamb to take away our sins and without his sacrifice we are doomed for eternity but the other side of the coin is very valid as well and that's what we see here in revelation because for all those who reject christ the lamb of god today they will face the lion they will come against the lion of the tribe of judah and in that role he will judge all those who reject him and who line up with the Antichrist. They follow the lies of Satan. This is what Jesus tells us in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So many today think, oh, Jesus would never judge me. Well, all judgment is committed to him. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You know, there's a lot of people today who say, well, I really like God, but I'm not so crazy about Jesus. If you don't honor Jesus, just like you honor the Father, then you're not honoring the Father. Again, the Old Testament gives us many examples of the Messiah in that role. Here's an example, Psalm 2, verse 9. It says of the Messiah, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So here in Revelation 14, we see Jesus, and he's in this role. Here we see that he's wearing a crown upon his head. The word here for crown is Stephanos. It means a crown of victory. Later we see him wearing the diadema. It's the crown of authority because he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. But this is a crown that he's going to be victorious over all of God's enemies. We also see here that he's sitting upon a white cloud. Again, we see the full picture of this in chapter 19, but Jesus is always associated with clouds. I mean, in general, God speaks a lot about clouds in the Bible. You know, when Moses was up on the Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, a cloud covered the mountain. When he comes down and then he's given the instruction to build a tabernacle, they finish the tabernacle, a cloud covers the tabernacle. Anytime they move the tabernacle, it says there was a cloud um, that followed them by day that kept them protected. And then when we see Solomon dedicating the temple, a cloud came so thick over that temple, it says the priest could not minister any longer in the temple. Jesus, when he ascended back up into heaven after his resurrection, he was with the disciples for 40 days, and then it says he received up into heaven in a cloud received him out of their sight. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 9. I can't wait for this one. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ. So those Christians who have died, their spirit is with the Lord, their bodies, they're waiting for the resurrection body. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then about seven years later, when Jesus returns at the second coming, it says he's coming with the clouds. Remember Revelation 1, 7? Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. So Jesus... Here it says, put in the sickle, it says the harvest of the earth is ripe. Notice that word ripe there. It literally means it's overripe. It's on the verge of becoming rotten. If it gets any more ripe, it's going to be rotten. 
You know, you ever buy bananas at the store and you get them and they're just starting to turn yellow. Oh, these would be great. Elizabeth likes them when they're that way. And then they'll sit on the counter. Then a week later, <laughs> not so good. You know, there's like they're overripe and I, she can't eat them. They tickle the back of her throat. And, you know, some people have an allergy thing to that. And so we know how things get when they're overripe. When they start to rot, we get rid of it. This is just before it's going to rot. God doesn't rush into judgment. This shows us his patience because we all deserve to be judged. This world deserves to be judged now. But he is patient. He doesn't desire for people to perish, but for people to come to Christ. This is what we read in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. That means slow. He's not slow about His promise, as some count slackness. But is long-suffering, that means patient, toward us. Here's the key. Not willing that any should perish. But for all, but that all should come to repentance. I mean, God says pretty much the same thing in Ezekiel. A couple times he says, you know, turn, turn from your evil ways. I take no delight in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want to see people die. Jesus was sent here to die for us, to die in our place. But the fact of the matter is there are multitudes of people in every generation that are overripe and they need to be harvested for the kingdom of God before it's too late. This was the, the meaning behind the words of Jesus. Remember when he's meeting with the woman at the well and she's all excited. She runs back to Sychar, her home village, tells everybody there, I think I've met the Messiah. And then it says they all come to Jesus. They're all rushing out where the disciples were by Jacob's well. And this is what Jesus see, says when he sees all these people coming toward him. John four thirty five. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Why does he use that word that's already white for harvest? Because the wheat, when it's golden brown, then it's time to be harvested. When it starts to turn white, it's overripe. That's all he's saying. Don't say there's four months and then we'll get serious about being a light and salt to those around us. Don't say I'll wait till next year and then maybe I'll tell somebody about Jesus. They need to hear now. You can Google how many people are going to die in the world this year, 2023. Well, how many died in 2022? It's almost 60 million people worldwide. On average, we're almost 60 million people every year die. And I just wonder how many people are dying without ever hearing about Jesus, or people dying and they've rejected the Lord. There should be an ongoing urgency on our part to let others know that God loves them. Jesus paid the price for their sins. He shed his blood so they could be forgiven. And because he rose from the grave, he can give you everlasting life. That's why he loves you. That's why he died for you. He wants you to come to him for salvation. The Apostle Paul certainly had that sense of urgency in his own life. He was either proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever he went, or he was exhorting the body of Christ, trying to stir them up to be that witness for Jesus. We read this in Paul's letter to 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you, not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, you receive the forgiveness of God. You're a new creation in Christ. You're born again. You're going to heaven. You didn't receive that in vain. There's people that need to hear the good news. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of of salvation. So we should always have that desire to be light and salt, to be vessels of honor that Jesus fills up and uses to pour out to those around us of the goodness and grace of God, because it's going to be too late for some people. 
So don't say, well, yeah, in four months, then I'll get busy. Or when I retire. Or next year, maybe I'll start being a witness. It could be too late. Let people know now. Look at verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Again, about to rot. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Again, this is a preview of Armageddon. So God uses this image of the winepress to describe how he is going to bring judgment on the unsaved, on the unrepentant sinners who follow the Antichrist. Mankind will be gathered from all over the world, and we'll see this again later on in chapters 15 and 16. The, Satan will send out these spirits, evil spirits. They're going to bring everybody to the valley of Megiddo. Armageddon is going to take place there. I believe hundreds of millions of people are going to gather there. And when I read about being in a wine press, you know how you stomp on the grapes and everything. And I'm old enough to remember every time I think of that, I think of I Love Lucy. And there's Lucy stomping all these grapes and the juice flows out. But we're going to see this is not a laughing matter. This is not grape juice. This is the blood of the lost who are going to be poured out because of their sin and rejection of God. This is brutal. Now, how horrible will this be? Verse 20, And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's about 184 miles. So it says this is the blood of men. Again, not grape juice. It flows for about 184 miles. And it looks like the blood is going to pool up in some areas because of all the people gathered there and the wrath of God is coming upon them. It's going to pool up four feet high to the horse's bridles. How can this even be possible? Again, when we get to chapter 16 of Revelation, we're going to see that a couple of things are going to happen with the final judgments. God is going to send 100-pound hailstones of ice to these gathered here. So picture like half the size, I don't know, how 100-pound block of ice. That's a lot. And a bunch of these start falling on the people gathered in Armageddon. And then at the same time, there's a judgment where the sun is going to be heated up and scorch everybody. So you've got all these 100-pound hailstones hitting people, the sun melting all the ice, all the blood mixed together. I can picture 184 miles like a river flowing down. And that's the valleys there in Israel equal about 184 miles, by the way. So it's all going to pool up and spread all over. It's going to be horrible beyond description. Again, this is why it's called the Great Tribulation. This is not for the bride of Christ. This is for unrepentant sinners. Matthew 24, verse 22. This is why Jesus says these words. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's the Jewish people, those days will be shortened. The prophet Joel, he, has, he sees the same thing. And this is what Joel writes in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in, notice the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. I personally believe that all people find themselves in the valley of decision. In other words, people need to decide, am I going to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Or am I going to continue to live life my way and reject God's word. Reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time that you make a decision. Because at this time of judgment and wrath, God has already made his decision. 
And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but when God pours out his wrath, there's no apologies. I mean, I read this and like, oh man, this is sad. But you know, God is perfectly just. He's perfectly righteous. His wrath is perfectly just and righteous. He's given mankind every opportunity to come to him, be saved. But unfortunately, most people choose the broad path and they stay in rebellion against the Lord. But praise the Lord for his mercy, for his grace, and his amazing love that broke through so many of our rebellious hearts and minds. Because we are in Christ, we're not going to face this wrath. I don't know why some Christians think, yeah, we're all going to go through the wrath of God. I look forward to it. I'm going to have my seven years of food stored up. <laughs> have fun with that. God doesn't beat up the bride of Christ before the wedding. If any of you beat up your wife before you got married, I'm sure your marriage didn't last. It's just not the heart of God. The Bible says that Jesus took all of the wrath and punishment we deserve upon ourselves when he hung on the cross. That was a once and for all sacrifice. And the Bible calls this propitiation, which means God was satisfied. His wrath was satisfied in Christ because Christ became the object of God's wrath on the cross. This is why you don't have to face it. This is what we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And so whoever comes to Christ, he will give you the free gift of eternal life because he loves you. You don't want to face the lion. Receive the lamb today. So let me close with a few verses that give us the promise that we will not go through the Great Tribulation. Again, the Great Tribulation is God's wrath poured out. In this world, Jesus says, you will have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. That tribulation is from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yes, we get hassled today. We get different things coming against us. We might face hardships, disease, whatever it might be. That's not the wrath of God. God's wrath is something that none of us are destined for. So I'll look at these verses. Just You can write them down. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul says to them, To wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Praise the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, Paul reiterates this, saying, For God did not appoint us to wrath, Again, he's speaking of God's wrath against sinners, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I already quoted Romans 5.10, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. John 3.36, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Before I got saved... When I was in rebellion and wickedness and sin against the Lord, uh, I was just before my 21st birthday, and I was planning this big party at San Diego State with my baseball buddies. And two weeks before my birthday, I got saved. Best thing that ever happened to me. Because I might have died. Who knows what would have happened. But I went instantly from being under God's wrath to now he removed that cloud of condemnation that was hanging over me. He did that with all of us because we were all under condemnation, wrath. Again, John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's that wrath is hanging over your head. You want that cloud of wrath to be removed from your life today? Then open up your heart to Jesus. He will set you free because he loves you. So you're in that valley of decision. Ask yourself, is Jesus my Lord? Is he my Savior? Have you placed your faith and trust in him alone for your eternal life? If you have, you've passed from death to life. If you have, you are going to go to, directly to heaven when you die. Be absent from the bodies. Be present with the Lord. You are saved, as fully saved as you could ever be. 
we're in this process of sanctification right now, but again, Paul says you're justified. When you came to Christ, Jesus came into your life, and he justified you just as if you'd never sinned. That's how the Father sees you right now. When our life on earth is done, we'll be, we'll be glorified. When the rapture takes place, we'll receive our glorified bodies. Don't ever get discouraged thinking, man, I'm stuck with this forever. No. No, you've got a new body, an immortal body. 1 Corinthians 15 says that we will go from death to life. It says that we will go from mortal to immortality, from a body of corruption to incorruption. That's when we're glorified. Right now, we're in the sanctification process. This is why we still struggle and wrestle with our flesh, with the lies of the world around us, but we've got to stay in the Word of God, keep coming back to Jesus, because this is where our hope is always found in the Lord according to His Word.